everyone, my name is Zach Redrup, you're listening to the It's Not A Phase podcast, and on this episode I'm joined by rising pop rock duo Honey Revenge. We talk about their newly released debut album Retrovision, how the band formed from their previous project Forever Emerald, collaborating with the likes of Chris Crummett, Eric Ron and Zach Jones, signing with Thriller Records, selling out their upcoming debut UK show in a day, pizza toppings and loads more. Now, if you enjoyed this or any other episode of the podcast and you want to show your support, there's a few ways that you can do that. Number one, leave a rating and review wherever you're listening to this. It takes just a few seconds and it really does help. Number two, share this on your social media, whether that be Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, wherever. Or number three, if you want to go the extra mile, you can pay a little bit each month to join the Patreon and in return you'll get access to episodes early along with some of our perks. Or you can pick up some merch from the store. All the links to that and the podcast socials where you can follow us can be found at itsnotaphase.co.uk. That's itsnotaphase.co.uk. And now with all that out of the way, let's jump right into this week's episode of It's Not A Phase. What's up everybody? Thank you for joining me on this episode of It's Not A Phase where I'm joined by Devin and Donny from Honey Revenge. How are you both doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having us. So good. Thank you. Great to have you on. So, I mean, yeah, the, the big news is obviously your debut album, Retrovision, is out now. It's out in the world. How does that feel? I mean, you know, a debut album is, you know, such a, a landmark for any band. Like some bands don't even get to that point to put out a full length debut album. But here you are. Yeah, it was not initially an album. I'll tell you that much. It was just supposed to be an EP. And then we just wrote too many songs. And like, even then, not all of them made the album. So it's crazy that it's an album. And it's crazy that it's like the first piece of work that we're putting out outside of singles. I think a lot of people look at us as a band that kind of just came out on the scene, which is also true and also not true. It's like hard to explain. We like started this band in like 2020. A good batch of these songs have existed from even before that. And since then, you know, there's songs on this record that I just got notifications we started working on two years ago. So it's wild that they're out now and like things that I didn't think we're going to be in the world that people were going to listen to i don't know donnie if you can agree with that but yeah no, that shit's crazy yeah I-, I didn't personally think i'd have an album out ever so that's just pretty cool to have I-, I didn't expect fight or flight to make it at all i'm not gonna lie and people really fuck with that song so that's really cool to see that was the first song i wrote and i was like damn this one's kind of cool huh <laughs> so for it to like make the record and like get a positive response it's like sick <laughs> we mentioned there that it became an album when it was initially like an ep when did it begin kind of transforming into you know we're going to go for a full-length album first because as you say like bands tend to do an ep before a full-length album comes along i think donnie and i are both album people i've always been just like a big fan of records i love to collect records i love to use them as decor i love like i played cds before i had a record player and I think Bob, who is the a r for our label, also very much a record person. Like he's been very supportive and allowed us a lot of creative control, which is awesome. And he's very collaborative. Like we've talked at great lengths about everything. And I think it just kind of we realized there was the potential for there to really be like a full idea there that could be translated into an album. And that's how it became an LP instead of an EP. It was just kind of like, oh, shit, there's a lot of songs here. And like, we didn't want to stop the creative process. Like we were kind of we're lucky. I think a lot of bands, when they put together an EP or an album, they have to like, you know, depending on where they live geographically, have to fly to somewhere to work on that. And they get like a limited period of time. And there's kind of like this tenseness and there's this timer going of like, hey, OK, click, click, you know, tick tock, tick tock. You got to get that done, you know. And we're very, very fortunate to live in L.A. where there's an abundance of very talented writers and producers that we were able to collaborate over a period of time. And there are songs on the record, like I said, that are older and songs that we literally just finished right before we left for our first tour. And so it's really, really crazy because that's kind of how it it worked out, you know, is like, we didn't really want to put a limit on the songs we were going to write. We wanted to give our best foot forward. And for that to happen, I think you've got to just continuously keep writing and not stop. And we were very, very like lucky to have that opportunity. And that's how Retrovision kind of became the album that it is, you know, we, with a lot of support and just like trust and faith. Yeah, I guess obviously the benefit of an album is that you can't really get with singles. I mean, yeah, you can get singles out, you know, fairly quickly. And I guess you can experiment a bit more with singles, arguably. But 
with an album, you get the album experience, right? You can't really do that by putting out, you know, a single every couple of weeks or something like that. You can kind of, even though it might not be like a concept record, you can kind of have like a running thread through the whole thing that pieces all of the, the songs together. Yeah. I think the industry has changed a lot and evolved a lot since I was a kid. I think when I was younger, I mostly saw bands and artists putting out like, you know, one or two singles. But I think it's really valuable for us as a younger band to have been able to put out a good chunk of singles because I think there's people that are still discovering songs that we've had out for, you know, three to six months that now because it's part of an album, they're more inclined to give us that chance and listen through it as a whole. I think I always underestimate that part of the industry is like the singles are constantly reminding people that we're doing stuff and whether they listen or not, they know something's coming because we're constantly giving them something. And I didn't fully grasp that idea when we started doing this. I wasn't sure I wanted to do so many singles. And I think it really, like, we benefited a lot from that. You know, I think it gave people the chance to discover us and it gave us the chance to really show our aesthetic over and over again and drive that image home and that message home. So I think as much as I didn't necessarily know that that was how it was going to work, it I just had to trust the process. And I think it worked out to the best of its ability that way. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a it's a great record. And, and like I say, that the singles were, were great. And seeing them in the concept of an album also works as well. Like, obviously, the song Distracted kind of helped propel you guys quite a bit. And kind of seeing it in the concept of a closer on the, on the album, it, you know, completely makes sense. But then you've got a song like Airhead, which has kind of got like a, you know, a, a, a kind of chunky riff that brings it in. That's kind of, I think you've kind of mentioned in other conversations, Donnie, that it's kind of bringing in subtly your kind of metalcore influences in that kind of chunky riff that comes in. Exactly. Yeah. We're just trying to like take inspiration from anywhere that feels right. You know, like I don't want to put us in a box like, between the two of us, only one of us plays an instrument, you know? So I don't want to pigeonhole us as like, oh, they sound like power chords and that's it, yeah. you know? So I'm trying to like, I, 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 want, I want us to create with everything that's out there. There's so much more than just strumming on a guitar, you know? We can do so much more. And I want people to know that when they come in, you get like this chunky ass riff into like the fucking 80s, like muted guitar thing through the verses, just yeah. everywhere. You know, keep people on their toes. What we're yeah. trying to experiment, explore a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Like, especially in kind of this this day and age, like genres bleed into each other so much more now than than they used to. And like, it's it's kind of strange when I hear people say like, "Oh, I only listen to metal music, or I only listen to pop music, or I only listen to punk music." Because the best way I kind of describe it is, you know, kind of different cuisines. Like, you don't just eat Italian food. You don't just eat Chinese exactly. food. You don't just eat whatever food it may be you dabble in loads of different things exactly that's the only way to like keep it fresh to keep yourself enjoying food period <laughs> exactly if i only ever eat a peanut butter sandwich and that's the only thing i ever eat i'm gonna get tired of it after a while but if i put like uh, that was a really bad example to try to add stuff <laughs> to <laughs> but yeah we could put more stuff in the sandwich and keep it fresh for more people to enjoy yeah and then the next day you can have a different sandwich exactly I don't know, some, some olives or something <laughs> on a sandwich. <laughs> they know I don't like olives. I think they said that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I, I hate olives as well, so I'm, I'm with you. Hey, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, they're my favorite. I love them. Oh, I, I, no, I, yeah, Donnie and I have opposite when it comes to pizza. We can't get pizza together because my, I'm like, I used to be a really picky eater. I'm not as much anymore now that I'm vegetarian. But the two vegetables I just like, I truly cannot do are mushrooms and olives. And that's all they get on their pizza. They will get like a mushroom olive pizza. And it. it so you don't out. eat any of it. That's why. <laughs> can't do it. It kind of works out. <laughs> so, so what are your favorite toppings? Say that you went for a pizza. What would you go for? You know, I love a pesto. Um, I think pesto is really good. Always down for like bell peppers. I think they're really just like crunchy. And I like. I'm very texture based with food that I like. Um, so it's like, I like a crunch. I love arugula and I love spinach. And my old, I used to actually work at a pizza place. So there was this pizza they had there that had like puree eggplant. So it wasn't like fried or pad hay. It was like nice. soft. And it was that with the peppers was like so good. I, I tend to go for, if I get a choice, jalapenos, Ooh. pineapple. Can you get the sweet and spice? It's kind of a, a okay. good mix. 
That sounds pretty good. I probably want to put something a little crunchy. Like you'd have to probably cook the jalapenos pretty good for me. Okay. Unless you want to add like peppers, that would probably really help. But no olives, <laughs> zero olives. Fuck an olive, fuck a mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, I respect that. Well, yeah, you're putting pineapple on your pizza, but it makes sense because it's like the this push and pull of flavor going on. You exactly. know, it's not just an atrocity. I, I respect the vision. I see. I see it. I, I want a taste ride when I'm on my pizza. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So in, in terms of, you know, Honey Revenge, it's, you know, in the grand scheme of things, Honey Revenge is a new band. So I just want to kind of take a step back and, you know, into how the kind of project began. Because I think, Devin, you're in a like a more pop punk focused kind of band called uh, Forever Emerald. And I think, I mean, you can, guys can correct me if I'm wrong here, but then... Donnie, you were planning to join the band and then obviously things kind of changed. And then at some point from then to Honey Revenge being a thing, that's kind of how it came about. So what kind of happened there? So, yeah, pretty much exactly what you said. Uh, I saw Dev's old band, a video of them floating around on Instagram. This bitch did a front walkover is what I've learned it is called. (laughs) Uh, She did a front walkover while she was singing. And like kept going, kept the verse going. It was right with the drop. I was like, yo, yes. this is sick. So I sent the band a message. I'm like, yo, y'all are tight as fuck. Uh, I'm about to move to LA. What's the music scene like? Is anyone looking for like a guitar player? Yada, yada, yada. They were uh, sending audition tapes, got in, uh, joined the band. We meet up and then, you know, life happened. We were living through a pandemic. So everyone kind of went their own ways as time progressed, which was a little unfortunate for me personally <laughs> because at this point i like i hadn't even written a song yet right so i was like super excited to be like yeah i'm in this band they're gonna teach me how to write songs we're gonna do stuff and they just left they were not there oh, God. so that fucking sucked <laughs> but yeah I, I move out move across the country to la get there join this band and it kind of we work on the first song we put out miss me we started that with everyone, and then before that song finished, we kind of dispersed. Right. Uh, so we started writing this song, and it just kind of progressed. We got in the room with our producer, KJ, and that dude just, like, took me under his wing. Is like, this is how you write a song. And <laughs> a beautiful relationship lost him. I'm going to be honest. I forgot the root of the question. What was I supposed to get to? <laughs> I think you got there. I think you got there. You know, okay. we were <laughs> talking about exactly what you're saying just like how it transformed and that's pretty much what happened I mean I think Donnie like I can't speak highly enough of how they handled that situation because I've talked about it in other interviews I was kind of at my wits end with it you know I think you get very very close with the people that you collaborate musically with it's a very vulnerable thing to do because you're talking a lot of the time from a singer's perspective at least about your personal life and your personal issues and the things that are affecting you. And I think when like you get that close to someone and then they decide to leave, whether or not it's a personal attack, it feels like it is because you're wondering if it's you, if you're not talented, if you're not processing your emotions properly, if you're not communicating in a way that they find interesting enough to stick around and whether or not that was the case, that's how it felt. And Donnie had just moved here and they, God bless them had never, like they said, written a song before. They didn't know how to produce. I don't play any instruments. Like that's as much as whatever people become solo artists and they do their thing. Like I've always loved a band dynamic because I can only go so far in my own brain instrumentation wise. I can't play an instrument. I can't write drums, you know? And for me, it's so interesting to hear other people's perspectives on music. And I was pretty crushed when everyone went their own ways for whatever reasons they did. And did not necessarily want to continue on. And Donnie was just stoked to fucking be there and stoked to be playing shows in California and meeting new people. And again, they were 18. So they were fully in a developmental state growing into themselves, figuring out who they wanted to be as a person. And I was a little older and a little more bitter about how it was all going down. And, you know, you get a lot of FOMO, I think, because that's a very make or break time in a music career for a young person is like, I watched a lot of my friends kind of take off with their careers and get to tour. And I'm a very proud person. I get very proud, but I also get very, very jealous. And it's not my healthiest trait. I think it. I like to say I uh, I like to succeed in spite of, like it fuels me. 
And yeah. maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. But I think for me, it was like, I had kind of lost that steam and I was very sad, but anytime I would get sad or feel like, you know, comparatively I could be doing this, this, and this Donnie was like, but like, think about how cool what we're doing is, you know, and always kind of kept me up. And I felt the need to like, keep going just because I wanted them to see what could potentially happen. And I didn't know it was going to be this, like I could have never, ever predicted it was going to be honey revenge. You know, the idea of being a duo, I fought that for a really long time and it caused me a lot of hurt, you know, trying to force people to be the kind of bandmates we needed when they weren't ready or willing. And it just like, again, it, it fucks with your head. You know, you wonder, is it me? Am I having too high of expectations? Is it my art? You know, that's a really, really harmful thought for sure. And I think when I finally accepted it was when it really started to work because me and Donnie are just like, we'd been working together one-on-one for so long. And the idea, like, I, I can't think now why I would have ever wanted to involve someone else yeah. that wasn't on that level and on that same page. But I think once I accepted that was once we really started to propel forward. And I was just like, I'm going to do what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. And that's what people were really receptive to. And that's just like the long story short. But it just like started with me trying to force this like multi-piece band when it just like, what I don't think it was what was right for these songs and this project and this journey you know and i think it's going exactly how it's supposed to and i think it's really hard to trust the universe sometimes but i think that's what retrovision is about a lot of it is just like your perspective and how you choose to engage with the universe and yourself and your relationships like that's very vital i think to the story of the band and to the album i mean that makes total sense what you're saying Devin. like it's hard to kind of especially if you put so much time an effort into uh, a band and it kind of isn't going the way you want then of course you're going to feel a bit defeated and it's hard to not compare yourself to other people when you're trying to achieve the same things but at this you know at the same time look at how it's kind of like evolved and blossomed into what honey revenge is and i mean for you donnie as well i guess it must have been you know unintentionally kind of a whirlwind for you to you know you've come to la you, you know the intention is to kind of join this established band already and then obviously for one reason or other kind of things are, are changing beyond what you expected and then you're kind of becoming the kind of main person working on the instrumentation i guess i, I don't know if that's yeah. like a bit of pressure for you at least to begin with anyway oh yeah <laughs> oh tremendously i was terrified like i said earlier thank god for kj dude our producer josh Strock. uh he genuinely took the time and was like yo like I was already writing songs and stuff. They weren't good. And he took the time to be like, maybe let's, he would take what I already had. And was like, this is cool. This is kind of weird. This is why it's weird. What if we tried something like this? And he just kind of like slowly gave me these tools that I needed to like learn how to do what we needed to do. Uh, but yeah, it was terrifying. Cause I remember like vividly saying like in the first emails to dev, like, on the auditions i'm so excited to like have another guitar player to be around and like learn from and stuff and then like literally a month after i got here that wasn't a thing anymore so it was definitely it took time for me to build up the confidence to yeah. be the only guitar player in a band that, that was just terrifying to me i tried to fight it for a long time like indistracted and just like throughout the record entirely there's like these harmonies going on and like these dueling guitar parts and that's on purpose yeah. you know but i don't know exactly like dev said i think everything's going exactly the way that it needs to be going for us right now yeah and now you're the guitar player you are the guitar player in the band so and now i can't imagine it any other way so it's like crazy how that stuff works out yeah do you think you know, going as as a, a duo, I mean, you know, you mentioned earlier, Devin, that you kind of resisted it to begin with. Do you think it kind of helped? Is it like less restrictive, you think, because there's less kind of people involved and it's kind of more creatively streamlined? Do you think that's kind of how it differs? Yeah, I think it's not always easy to get on the same page. I think that is the beautiful thing about being in a band is the collaborative aspect of it and maybe getting the viewpoint that you would not normally have on your own. I think that's what I've always loved about it. I grew up in choir and stuff, and that's a very, very large group dynamic and a lot of just team effort. And I think that's what I loved. And I think in my old band, we were really, really young, all of us. And we started that band at like 18, 19, and we were still figuring out not just how to play instruments, but how to just like exist as adults on our own with our friends and keep those relationships, you know, calm 
and not crazy. That's the beautiful thing about being in a band when you're that young is I learned so, so much from that experience. And I was able to carry a lot of that communication over into this project. Um, I think I'm very loud and I'm very out there and I kind of just say what's on my mind all the time. And I don't always process how what I'm going to say is going to affect a group. And I've had to learn to reel myself in. And I've also, if I'm not going to do that, I've had to learn to just at least check in with Donnie and be like, Hey, sorry, if I was being fucking wackadoodle do back there, you know, <laughs> like I'm very self-aware almost to a fault and it's kind of crippling. And I think a lot of that bleeds through again in the music, like not to obviously like we're talking about the record, but it just all ties in really like, the record is a documentation of this journey of just like learning how to be a person in this time period at this age with these people. And not everyone is going to reciprocate that energy and that effort that I put in. And I think being a duo has really helped that because we're on the same page. And if we're not, we get there eventually. And I wouldn't necessarily want to involve another person into that dynamic right now. Not to say it won't happen eventually, but they'd have to be so like we both put in our full selves into this project. Like I do a lot of content. Donnie does a lot of writing. We both for most of this time have been working one to two, you know, jobs to be able to fund it up until we were signed and even after so that we could afford to leave and go tour and sustain ourselves. And I think we'd have to see someone wanted to care as much as we did. And I think that's easier said than done. People, I think, assume that they are at that level and that they want to care. But then when it actually comes to crunch time, they don't want to put in that effort. And that's fine. But that's just where we're at is like, we need someone and each other are that someone right now. Like I, I know Donnie trusts me to make decisions, but I'm still going to run it by them. You know, yeah. like I'm still going to every single time I have to like make kind of a hard, tough decision. I still talk to Donnie about it, you know? And even if I know that they're just me like, yeah, fucking do it. I don't care. You know, I still like, I never want to feel like this is just my thing. And I know Donnie never wants to feel like it's just their thing. Like it's a, like it's the honey is Donnie and I'm the revenge. I always joke, you know, like, (laughs) and it's pop and it's rock and it's yin and it's yang. It's like, it's a duo. It's two people. It's two personalities. It's two brains, you know? So I think again, sorry, long story short, but there's a lot to it. You know, like it's not for lack of trying that we're a duo. You know, it just is what made sense and it's what worked. So, yeah, and it, and it clearly works. Like you say, one of you is honey, one of you is the revenge. And that's kind of what brings this mix in together. And we love our live bandmates too. Like our drummer, Matt, is so incredibly talented. He's like one of the best drummers. I've, I've been playing shows with him and his other bands since I was in my old band for years and years and years. And I've always thought he was one of the best drummers. Our bass player, Tay, was in Forever Emerald with me. They're one of my oldest friends. Their birthday is the day before mine. We've had joint birthdays since we were teenagers, you know, and it's not for lack of love for them, but also like we get a lot of flack. You know, we recently had a video where I make a joke like this is for everyone that says the drummer and the bass player don't get enough love. Fuck you, essentially. Yeah. And, you know, we get like, well, you don't put them in the video. It's like, well, they're not doing all the stuff. Yeah. And but when when they're when they're there, they do everything we could possibly imagine and more. You know, they do exactly what we ask of them. And that's what I love about that dynamic is like we have live people that are amazing crew members. They're homies. Their moral support. Touring is not fucking easy, especially when you're very new to it and you're getting thrown into it at a very fast rate, you know, like we, our first fucking tour was six weeks long in the end of winter. So we were jumping weather. We were messing with our health and our mental health and not sleeping. And, you know, you want to be around people that you're going to want to be around when you're not wanting to be around people, (laughs) like, (laughs) you know, people that understand you. And we have that. We're so lucky to have that team. Like, obviously, Honey Revenge is a duo, but it's so not just us. It's like we like to say it's the HRCU, the Honey Revenge Cinematic Universe. You know, we have like a very amazing group of friends and family and just like overall team that back us and get the vision. And it's so much more than just the two of us, but we are the driving force. Well, you mentioned before, you know, um, like working with KJ, and I know you had like other like collaborators that you've worked with you know like Zach Jones, uh, Chris Cummett, Eric Ron just to name like a few what do you kind of feel though those people kind of bring to the table into and into you know the the honey revenge formula? From my perspective at least it feels like they bring experience <laughs> a level of I've been this I've been here before I've seen this I've done this I know 
they see the vision that I'm trying to present. Like, especially at the time when we were making this record, I could get demos to a point and there was a definite plateau because I'd only been doing it for a little bit of time. So I feel like, especially for this record, we could like present an idea and they could be like, okay, I see where you're at. I see the finish line. This is what we need to get there. And they could just like do that extra stuff on top and like fix the shit that I didn't know what I was doing yet. You know, they just like brought that level of professionalism to make us sound like a band, even if it's just like me in my bedroom, you know, what would you say, Doug? I mean, just all of those people have worked on so much music that has inspired me since I was so young. So I think, you know, as much as we give and we take, you know, I got so much of my musical influence from people like Eric Ron and Chris Crummett worked on albums that shaped me not only as a musician, but as a person. So they already kind of knew what I was going for because a lot of what I was going for came from stuff that they helped and had their hand in creating. Yeah, Mike Green also, we got to work on Are You Impressed With Him? But I think he really, just the couple sessions we did, helped reshape my approach to songwriting and lyricism and just melodic overall writing because it's really easy to get stuck in a habitual thing where you're like, doing the same thing over and over, especially for someone like me who doesn't play an instrument and doesn't have that part of my brain. Like I'm not thinking about the chords. I'm not thinking about the rhythm as much. I'm thinking about my part and how I can make it flow into a song that Donnie can then make music around and vice versa. So I think I gained a lot of knowledge and I think I fought for a long time working with songwriters, but we had also Canner who's fucking phenomenal and just like a genius at writing lyrics she's worked with also so many artists that I admire and you know people like to say oh you didn't write that but it was so collaborative like I come with an idea and I kind of will ramble as you can tell from this interview I will just go on and on and on in detail and detail about things that don't necessarily make the song any better it just like makes me feel like I'm scratching that itch and getting my feelings out and she just came in and fucking I say she gives the song a BBL you know she puts all the fat in the right places and puts it in a way that's like digestible to an audience and again we were just so lucky because I don't think a lot of young bands get that and I also think a lot of young bands are not open to that they want to be like well I wrote this whole thing and it's like you can still write the whole thing and have help you know and I think that's like again because I'm not in a band that's five people I'm in a band that's one other person but part of being in a band with multiple people is collaborating with those people. So if you're part of a team, they're still your team just because they're not the people who are being like, no, notor- like getting that notoriety for it, you know? Yeah. So I think we were just, again, so, so lucky to work with so many people that I look up to and respect that it just came out exactly how it should have, you know, again, the universe, just trusting the process, like, even though it was kind of nerve wracking and it's very, again, a vulnerable thing to just like talk about your problems with people and like try and make art out of it. I think we had all the right people for yeah. that process. Yeah. I guess some people, you know, in kind of situations like that, they'd argue that, you know, there's that saying too many cooks in the kitchen, you know, will spoil things, but with the sound of the album and all the kind of genres you kind of dip in and out of, and you know what you've you've explained to me during this conversation. If anything, that is what benefits the album. It's what made the album what it is, and what makes Hunter Revenge what it is. Totally. And you know, with all these kind of different blends of styles and genres, are there any sounds that you didn't have the chance to explore so far in your in your material that you would like to kind of dip your toes into, and in whatever comes next? EDM, K-pop. Club music, those are like my top three that I'm going for right now. Uh, I want to get some more jazzy stuff going too. I want to get some more jazz. Uh, I don't know. I just want to paint with everything. I want to use all the colors. I would love to like touch down like all the aspects. I think all of those genres have things to offer us and our sound. I think I'm hugely inspired by like synth pop and just like overall like Band Camino, Fickle Friends, Muna, like a little more like layered using more than just, you know, your typical guitar, bass, drums, vocals. Like, I'd love to do a lot of, like, harmonies. I'd love to work on that more. We have some really cool ones on this record. But again, I grew up in choir. So for me, that's such a huge change and feel on a lot of the music that I love is just, like, backing vocals and harmonies and the things that you don't necessarily notice at the first listen but are, are, like, pushing the melody to the forefront, I think, are very crucial 
And I'd love to play more with that. And I'd love to collaborate with more people. Like there's producers that we wanted to get in with more of their songs that we wanted to get in on the album that I would love to like maybe put out on a deluxe or like rework and make for the next album. You know, we don't want to stop and like limit ourselves to this, but there's a lot. It's just more writing, being more creative, pushing more boundaries, seeing where we wind up. I don't know. I want to be one of those bands that like we don't fit into a box, you know? Like that that's boring as fuck. I don't want to be like the band that sounds like that. I want us to be we have our identity and we sound like all of this different shit at the same time. You want to be a, be a post genre band, that's what you want. Yeah. We can fit on any lineup anywhere. Pull up at a jazz festival, we make sense. We got a set that can fit that. Fucking this is hardcore, we can do that. We can two step, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Open up for Cannibal Corpse. You can do that. Oh, that's the dream. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give them any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been sound checking every day with uh, with counting worms. And then the last few shows, he started doing uh, Raining Blood, too, just to feel something. <laughs> and God damn, it feels so cool to be on stage with Matt's back there with the double kick going. <laughs> it's awesome. Maybe in another life. You know, maybe you can, you know, explore a little bit of that genre. It, it, it might work. It's already in progress. <laughs> you haven't heard that yet, Dev. <laughs> Surprise, She's surprise. gonna hate it. It's gonna be so good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you guys have mentioned, you know, that you're signed to Filler Records and you got signed to them like pretty early on as well, which is fantastic in itself. And they're a brand new label, so it must have been kind of good to kind of grow alongside them as they're building up a, a reputation as well. Oh yeah, they're just like so supportive and so awesome. And I mean, Bob Becker has an insane track record for like just helping the trajectory of young artists and young bands. Like if you're familiar, like he founded like fearless records before he started thriller. And I think what drew me to that label was just the abundance of different kinds of music. You know, they have artists like Riley, they have Kaylee Moore, who's really amazing and does like really great, like indie pop, indie rock. And then you have bands like rain city drive, who I also feel like have taken their sound from one place to the other and been able to kind of, you know, reimagine what they make. Um, There's bands like the home team who are some of our favorite people and gave us our first touring opportunity and we owe so much to them and they they have influenced us so much. You know, I could go on and on. I think they know who's going to fucking make this scene like what it needs to be to be safe and also just fresh. I think they everyone there has a really great eye for talent and people. I think I can vouch that most of the people on that label are just like the best as people, you know, Nick Moore is also really great. JT, there's a, like Cassie, she does a lot of their socials and, you know, I love her, you know, I can't, our project manager, Ivan, it's like everyone, they're all working together and they all want what's best for their artists, which is really great. And they also, again, give as much like creative control as they can. Yeah. And that must have been great for you because of the, you know, how, um, how much you guys, you know, want to kind of dabble into different sounds and genres and stuff, because, you know, there's, there's always the, like the stereotypical kind of idea that labels, as soon as they have you, they control you. And that's not always the case. I definitely think it's the case in some situations. And I think we were lucky. I fought, like, I knew we needed to be on a label to do and accomplish what we wanted to financially. And just like connection wise, like I know a lot of people, but I don't know a lot of people everywhere. And I think I I wasn't going to sign to anywhere unless I felt like it was the right home for Honey Revenge. And they've just been very open-minded. I don't think we would have gone with them if they wanted us to stay just like a pop punk band because that's mm. never what we saw ourselves being. But when they signed us, we didn't know. You know, we had one song out. We were working on putting out Distracted when we started talking to them. And I think they trusted that we were going to figure it out eventually. You know, we definitely didn't know back then for sure what we were capable of putting out as a record or as an EP or whatever the plan was back then. I think they signed us because we were open to accomplishing more than just a corner of the industry. And now you guys have built up you know, a sizable fan base, which you call the swarm, which is a pretty cool name. How is it, you know, you, you know, you guys have gone on to tour now, you, you know, you've got another tour coming up very soon, seeing those numbers and kind of pictures of faces from this fan base you you know built online because you kind of you were born in like this band was born in lockdown basically to you know go from these numbers and faces to actual real life people and seeing them dancing and singing and connecting to your music right in front of your faces like that must have been such a 
and must still be such an amazing exhilarating feeling to to see it change and see what you've achieved in real life right before your eyes I mean yeah Donnie the craziest part for me is that we just like pretty much sold out a London show in like a day you can know? you fucking like, believe that shit <laughs> I, that's like a crazy thing to me because I've never been there what do you mean all those people are coming to see us and we've never been there that's crazy just even being in Canada and there was like people there just for us I was like am I on pranked <laughs> where are the cameras you know Dude, yeah, it was insane because like that first tour we did six weeks with the home team, uh, every show except for three of them were sold out. And every single show we went to, there were people that knew our songs. And that was insane because this is like first tour you've ever done. We played shows in at home and we like started getting people to know some of the words at home. Yeah. But then to go out everywhere to like the middle of nowhere in Florida at some church, Brandon, Florida. You know, <laughs> and then to have people there that are going hard for us in this super humid, sweaty room, you know, it's super cool to see. And then to go into Canada and people know the words there, too. And then this London show sells out in a day. It's crazy, especially for me. I don't I don't do the social media. That is all dead. That is her brain. Mine doesn't do it. So <laughs> I just like write the songs. Here you go. See you when we're at practice or whatever. So it's like extra crazy to see it manifesting as human beings over there a few feet in front of me while we're playing these songs yeah like human beings that you can you know you can see their reaction and how they're actually feeling towards the songs that you've written and you know either that's you know dancing or you know crying or laughing or just yeah shaking their ass like you know exactly and piggybacking on top of that again sorry you just like jog my memory is like after the show we hang out at the merch table and people will come up and they'll talk to us people be like hey never heard of you good set or they'll come up be like hey i found y'all like a year and a half ago your songs really helped me get through this tough situation it's like dude that's fucking sick <laughs> like that, i don't know it's like yeah i'm writing these songs because it's fun but like they mean something to people now yeah that, that's a whole new level and even if you kind of like intended to connect to people which you know to some degree you, you you obviously did i bet you could never have imagined that you would connect to the degree that you've witnessed so far and that's the way you guys are going it's only going to continue to go that way exactly that that's where my head's at right now <laughs> that's just cool i think what helps is even from like obviously i'm not seeing you, you you live yet and kind of from so from a outside of perspective there's the sense that you you want to build like a community and a safe space for these the, these fans that you've you've gathered and and built up, which you know every band should do to a degree anyway. I just I mean, would you agree? That's kind of like what part of the goal is here of a funny revenge. Oh yeah, a million percent, one million percent. I I think it's important that everyone should have a space where they can just go and like have fun and be safe and be themselves and. I think we have a really cool opportunity to foster that type of environment, uh, especially when we look as a rock band the way that we do. <laughs> you know, I feel like that's kind of an open door invitation to people that usually don't go to our type of shows, you know, but also our sound is this weird type of everything that anyone can listen to. You know, there's something for everyone in everything. So, yeah, exactly like you said, we're just trying to make this nice little 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 bubble for all these little honeybees to kind of have a nice little time <laughs> to swarm on in and dance to these bangers that you've made exactly flap your wings a little bit <laughs> take your stinger come on come on <laughs> but yeah I, we, everyone has a space to exist and and that's with us as long as you're not a dick well, you mentioned the london show is, is this this is going to be your first overseas show right which yeah. It's amazing itself. <laughs> yeah, I think we're in the works of trying to plan some more. Like we we're kind of just testing the waters with that one to see, you know, if people would even come. And the reaction was so crazy that we're, I think, looking to do maybe a show or two more. Who knows? I don't. Maybe I do. I don't know. Only time will tell. So other than the the London show, and obviously you've got this US tour coming in in, in just a few days. What else is planned so far for New Revenge in 2023 that you can talk about? Because I imagine there is plenty that you can't talk about just yet. Honestly, I think everything's out on the table right now. 
We don't have a fall tour booked. So if anyone wants to take us on tour this fall, please do. I quit my job and we'll be very bored and sad if we don't get to tour more. I'd love to go to places we haven't been. I think it's more just like things we want to do rather than things that we are doing. You know, I think the year is almost up in the perspective of like planning for a lot of the music industry. Because once the holidays hit, it kind of gets quiet. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I'd love to tour more maybe in like October, November before we go overseas just to like do our last little U.S. run. I'm just excited to kind of see where these songs go and who they interact with, because I think people are going to be now discovering us like this is when it's really going to happen is sure we've had these singles. But I think that this period of time now that the records come out is going to be when we find out the truth of like who fucks with us, you know. And, you know, I just am stoked. We want to do vinyl. I'm a huge vinyl collector. I know we're, we just sent out our variants for that, that we're waiting on and just like play these new places. Like we're hitting Nashville on this tour. We haven't played there yet. We're doing Virginia, which we haven't done. We're doing South Carolina. We're doing a few different cities that we didn't get to play last time. We're playing DC. Um, And I'm really stoked about that. We're playing Buffalo, New York. We only played New York city last time. So it'll be really cool, you know, just like I'm under traveled. So I'm always stoked to get to go to new places and meet new people. And I love Arrows in Action. They rock. And I'm excited to spend more time with them on this tour. I'm ready to go to the rock show. (laughs) Play some rock and roll. (laughs) You say there's things that, you know, aren't set in stone yet, but you would like to do. So let's say Honey Revenge on the year anniversary of Retrovision. What do you hope to have achieved by then? I'd love to play some festivals. I think that's one thing we haven't done yet. Play some real festivals and get to experience that life. That would be, I think, I is my main goal is because I grew up like that's where I discovered the scene was going to like a warp tour type situation. And I think that's really where you meet your people at that age. I'd love to headline eventually. I don't know outside of like these headline shows in Europe what it's going to be like in the US. Like I'd love to wait a little bit because I'm nervous to be completely real with you. That, you know, it's like you get really excited and then if no one comes, you're like, huh. So I think that's just like any artist, though. You know, I'm not trying to put that out into the universe. It's just like my general irrational fears. That'd be really cool. I'd love to do some features. I like I'd love to have someone feature on one of our songs. I think we purposely didn't put any features on our debut record because we wanted it to be our voices and our parts with the people that we worked with. And I'd love to have some features. And I love duets and I love harmonizing again. Um, Donnie, I don't know about you, but yeah, all of those things. But if we're thinking like purely anniversary talk, I, I, I would love to do a tour where we bring out a band I've been looking up to forever. I'm not going to name drop nobody because that doesn't seem like an appropriate thing to do at this stage. <laughs> However, I have some people in mind that I would love to tour with. And it would be really cool if we could do it with, with them supporting us. I want to do a lot of festivals. I, I want to have like, an annual just like fucking throw down party show where we just like get our homies bands together just like a little festival or something have a little honey fest and we can like sell honey from local bees or something i don't know i don't know just good vibes i don't have anything that's like dead set i need this to happen or else i don't know mainly that yeah i think sorry that was really long-winded for not a lot of substance (laughs) (laughs) well i think with the kind of trajectory that you are going on at the moment that you're gonna achieve a lot of what you've kind of mentioned there and and probably things you didn't even consider so i'd just say just you know (laughs) wait and see what comes comes around the corner for you thanks again for coming on to the podcast before i let you go and enjoy the rest of your day and getting ready for tour have you got any final words anything you want to say anything you want to plug the floor is yours thanks is the biggest thing i think we can't express enough gratitude it gets very it gets emotional sometimes because it's again I did not necessarily know if I was going to stick to this and seeing it really resonate with people has been surreal. So that's the first thing. Um, I always like to close out with, we have a discord, come hang, come make friends. You know, if you're ever trying to come to a honey revenge show and you don't have someone to go with, there is always someone in the discord that is looking for a homie at a show to hang out with. And it's a safe place to like interact with other honey revenge fans. Um, We are on tour all summer and in the winter, we're coming to the UK Follow us on our socials. I'm very active on there. If you get a response, it's me. Honey Revenge CA on everything. TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all of it. That's us. That's me running all shit. And then lastly, I my biggest thing that I always close with is go to a local show for us. 
we all started as local bands. All your favorite bands started as local bands. Um, and if you want to get into the music scene, that's the best way. If you really want to feel like you're growing with a band that you like, find your local scene, go to a show because it does exist, whether you think it does or not. You never know who's going to come out of your city just because they had their your support. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Keep up with us. Join your local scene. It's important. And be good people. Be nice. The most important rule. Be nice to people. Be nice. To people. <laughs> be nice. Don't be a dick. <laughs> it's not that hard. <laughs> yeah, I don't got nothing to plug. She hit all my stuff. Uh, stream Retrovision. Buy our record. We'll have vinyl eventually. But for now, maybe a cassette or a CD will hold you over. Yeah. Rocking. Rolling. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Yeah, of course. Thanks for coming on. Best of luck on the tour. And hopefully I'll see you when you both come over to the UK. Oh, well, you better let us know. We're going to be looking for you. Careful. I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> Have a great day, Zach. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Catch you later. And that is it. Thank you so much for listening. Again, if you enjoyed this or any other episode of the podcast, then please leave a rating and review wherever you're listening to this. If you want to support the podcast further, you can go and give it a follow on social media, pick up something from the merch store, or subscribe to the Patreon to get early access to episodes. All the links can be found at itsnotaphase.co.uk. That's itsnotaphase.co.uk. Thanks again. Hopefully catch you on the next one. And remember, it's not a phase, it's a lifestyle.